Thank you for the invitation to speak. Hello, everybody. As a writer designer practicing on the fringes of the graphic design industry, I've long wondered about the disconnect between a field that equates its origins with the origins of written language, storytelling, and more specifically, cultural productions of early 20th century poet painters, radical language artists, utopians, and revolutionaries, but then define contemporary graphic design practice primarily as a commercial enterprise based largely on a corporate service model. So it's very encouraging to be part of this movement, along with other presenters at this conference, who are re-envisioning what graphic design is, who makes it, and how design shapes culture in so many ways. Part of that reimagining, I hope, is expanding the frame of graphic design to include contemporary forms of visual literature, such as artist books, electronic writing, graphic activism, and as yet unknown modes of storytelling. And as we rethink our roles as educator, I believe it's important to include more writing as a foundational part of the designer's skill set. That has been my role for the past 25 years in SVA's Designer as Author Entrepreneur MFA program, teaching a class called Writing and Designing the Visual Book. The primary focus of the course is creative writing, followed by typography as the main vehicle for giving shape to the writing. It's also an art of the book class, emphasis on writing and design composition as an integrated expression. The most rewarding part of the class is what the students bring to it and have made through the years. That's what I'm excited to share with you today. We've always had a very international group who come to the class with experiences of war, migration, love, loss, hybrid identities, cultural wisdom and confusion, and lots of humor, inquisitiveness, and stories to tell. I'm going to focus on student outcomes from a three week long bifurcated book project and a few final projects, but let me quickly give you a sense of how we build to that point in the class. On the first day, <clears throat> I present an overview of visual literature, beginning with cave painting and ancient pattern poetry up to the modern era and the boom of contemporary visual storytelling, typographically inventive novels, and electronic literature. Throughout the semester, we look at and study a range of vislit books, so students have tools for reading and discussing content and form. But being a studio class, the focus is on making. We start by exploding and reconstructing language, by making and presenting Dada poems in 2D, 3D, and 4D. Come in! Well, 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 look who's here! I haven't seen you in many a year. If I, I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. Then we build language up from scratch, a few words at a time, through word image equation projects, using more neutral and more expressive type image compositions. Then we really get the writing juices flowing through automatic drawing and continuous writing exercises that lead to crafting and visualizing short texts, composing variations as flats, then selecting one text to run through a 16-page book. Bruno Zaloum writes, how does a sanguine heart ever forget? Reham Ibrahim writes, I remember being stuck in Kuwait during the Gulf War. I didn't even know what war meant. I was seven. I hate the sound of thunder. It reminds me of war, the big, ugly, scary bombs, explosions, madness, blackness. Alice Henry writes about October being a month of firsts, lasts, costume parties, and fragmented memories. Nick Ace recalls three mornings. One was stuck in his head. One was yours, which was different than mine. Camille McMorrow writes about walking in San Francisco on a day when the path seemed to just unroll itself before me. 
We also have workshops in bookbinding, world building, and writing from multiple perspectives, which leads to the assignment that asks students to write and design a book from two or more perspectives. And the form and the content really need to grow out of each other. Peter Kinzel composed a book called A Part that you need to rip down its perforated center in order to read. On the left side, you read the woman's perspective of a couple's relationship. On the right, the guy's perspective. As you read, tear through the book, the narrators drift apart. By the end, they split up and you're left with two separate books. Samia Khalidis is Palestinian. Her book, The Separation Barrier, depicts opposing perspectives of the wall built by Israel, separating occupied territories in the West Bank from Jewish settlements and Israel. On one side, we read a narrative of an Israeli man who vehemently supports the wall as necessary for security. On the other side, the very different view of a Palestinian man who sees the wall as an isolating blockade that subjugates his people and creates impoverished ghettos. Lauren Manchik noticed how people on opposite sides of controversial issues use the Bible to bolster their arguments. Borrowing from Talmudic structures, Lauren annotates the most frequently cited passages used by both sides of seven different issues. Len Small composed a book about a scientist experiencing a life crisis and goes back in time to talk with his younger self. The book starts folded into a tight wad, then unfolds into a dialogue between older and younger self, contained within a single sheet of paper. Not a Seat's book is about a woman who repeatedly falls for guys who are either far out of her reach or cruel to her. The title, Oh, This May Sound Pathetic to You, is also the first line, followed by, But I Don't Care Because It's the Truth. Made in two editions, one in English, one in Arabic, the circular structure helps the reader feel Seat's protagonist's endless cycle of repeating the same mistakes as she spirals further into loneliness. Maybe you'll understand when you hear my story. I fell for a guy who I thought was the best thing that ever happened to me. He was my everything, my destiny. I couldn't bear the weight of my heavy heart. All I ever wanted was to feel weak in the knees, be head over heels. At bottom, she looks up and sees the pattern and the possibility of breaking it. Not as book won an audience choice Adobe Achievement Award. Donica Ida's trifurcated book is about the bombing of Pearl Harbor and its effects on her Japanese and Japanese American family. From three points of view, a family member who was in the Japanese military, another in the U.S. military, and those detained in American internment camps. Ji Un An wrote a tale of two chickens. On the left side of this laser cut book, Victor describes living on a free roaming organic farm. On the right, Lucy tells her story growing up inside crammed cages in a factory farm. Lucy eventually escapes and meets Victor at the organic farm. Life is good, except they sense danger lurking even in the sanctuary farm. Zenzeli Skylark's Never Dark Enough, Never Light Enough draws from her experience growing up as a person of mixed descent, seeking validation in all the wrong corners. Zenzeli says the design represents the bouquet of roses I never received. Seeking validation from each side of my family when in reality, I am the one that should give myself validation. Fiorella Basso composed a double flip book that forms a dialogue between a big city and a newcomer, uncertain if it's the right place for her. Unlike most flip books, this one facilitates multiple readings, speeds, and interpretations. For her trilingual book of buns, Jessica Lynn investigates three kinds of sandwiches by interviewing an American burger bun, a Japanese fried noodle bun, and a Chinese pork bun. Their attitudes reflect cultural differences and similarities. Based on his own experience as a nine-year-old, 
Walid el Khoury's book, Distance, takes place in the Egyptian desert. A father and son each tell their own version of losing one another in the immensity of the sand sea. Positioned on opposite ends, father and son are bound together by an accordion desert. As the tale unfolds, the vast distance shrinks till father and son finally, gratefully, find each other. Maya Sultani Nejad Dayan is from Iran. Her book, Taroth, devises a method for translating Farsi expressions that are poetic but don't make literal sense. Each spread features a common Taroth. On the right is the literal translation and pronunciation. On the left, with the help of a bound-in mirror, the metaphorical meaning of the phrase is revealed. Inez Ayers, 1440 Minutes in Buenos Aires, features Olivia and Daniel, who share a day together in Buenos Aires. Daniel is blind. His narrative is filled with descriptions of sounds, smells, touch, and feelings for Olivia. Parts of his texts are printed in Braille. Olivia's vivid descriptions help Daniel to see. In Olivia's narrative, we find out that Daniel secretly arranged for them to have a tango class. She feels embarrassed by her two left feet, but with confidence, Daniel guides Olivia through each step. Cecil Mariani's three volume, Brewing Tears into Teas, combines poetry with found objects reflecting extracts of emotion, everyday life, and simple consumption. Lena Lovelace's The Tiny Book is an ode to a faded friendship whose cracks grew deeper due to distance, a pandemic, and global upheaval. Bound and worn as a small necklace containing two accordion books, it's an intimate artifact of past love that somehow remains close to heart. I encourage students to think of ways of bifurcating their books through augmentation with other media. Najiba al Ghadban's A Broken Bird is an installation with video and kinetic typography projected onto a physical book. The first half describes the death of a pigeon and the narrator's sense of helplessness, followed by the pigeon's perspective, though Najiba thinks of it as an opening of the narrator's heart. Yoon B. Beek and Crystal Shin collaborated on a Bible corrupted by capitalism and algorithms. It looks like an ordinary Bible, but when you view it through the Artivive app, initial letter blocks function as QR codes that enable you to view passage-specific ads. In Genesis, for the divine inspiration you can receive using Adobe's Creation Cloud, or to find your missing rib with the Tender dating app. All kinds of products pop from Old and New Testament stories. Annie L. Pellison's used a more low-tech tool to augment her book, Monsters, a complex portrait of five people convicted of pedophilia. Their secrets are revealed to the reader with the help of a handheld blue light. Although most people consider her subjects monsters, Pellison's book is surprisingly empathetic look at people who almost all were victims of child sexual abuse themselves. Some students' final independent projects for this class have been influenced by the bifurcated book assignment. Reconstructed Memoirs is a collaborative multi-volume book by Raham Ibrahim and Mohammed Sharaf of their memories of the Gulf War as a seven-year-old girl raised in Kuwait and a nine-year-old Kuwaiti boy. Together, they evoke the ordinariness of growing up in war, as well as the confusion and terror. Divided into nine booklets, Donica Ida's collection of heartbreak stories are based on the broken relationships of nine of Donica's friends. Najiba al Ghadban's A White Asylum uses the institutional vernacular of mental health charts as a point of departure. Within its exposed spine and threaded exterior, the text and collaged images invite the reader to uncover entangled portraits that fluctuate between psychological profile and confessional prose. 
There are many wonderful and moving final book projects I'd love to walk you through, like Celine Bouchard's Die Cut Through Walls, inspired by Marcel Ames' short story, The Man Who Walked Through Walls, Martha Fierro's Personal and Practical Menstruation Guide, Harvey Bickmore's hilarious and revealing 120-page book celebrating the differences and similarities of five different sets of twins, and uh, Katrine Yoon's riveting book, Trimmed, depicting her experiences before and after having major jaw surgery in her teens. And I had hoped to tell you about the Visual Poetry and Vacant Spaces Project, my undergraduate community design class at SUNY Purchase worked on for five consecutive years, transforming vacant storefronts in downtown White Plains and helping revitalize a blighted neighborhood but my allotted time has come to an end. So I'll finish with this clarification. My argument for including writing as an integral part of design education is not that all designers need to become authors or vislit practitioners, though I hope more design students become aware of that as an option. More importantly, Providing experiences of authorship to design students helps enable them to see from the inside out how design can grow organically from meaning. And the fusion of writing and design can be a fertile ground for invention and innovation. Thank you very much.